Thank you everyone for joining our uh, Energy and Utilities Fireside Chat series. This is the third in our series. Uh, today's Fireside Chat, we're going to focus on the oil and gas industry and the role of renewables within the space of oil and gas, which is a topic area that really hasn't gotten a whole lot of discussion until recently. Uh, I want to introduce our panel for today. We have Casey Merriman from Energy Intelligence. Casey, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Tracy. I, as you said, my name is Casey Merriman. I'm with Energy Intelligence. I'm our Western Hemisphere Editorial Director and also uh, head up our Competitive Intelligence Service. Thanks for joining. Patrice Jelno from Capgemini. Yes, Patrice Jelno, uh, oil and gas lead uh, for now in Capgemini Invent the management consulting part of uh, Capgemini. Thanks for joining. As I mentioned, I'm Tracy Gilliland. I am a principal in our energy and utilities practice at Capgemini in North America. I've been around the oil and gas and energy industry for a large part of my career. And this is an exciting conversation to have. I want to acknowledge we're recording this on Monday, November 9th, 2020. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of changes that have happened over the last few months in the oil and gas industry since we first talked about recording this. So thanks, Casey and Patrice. I look forward to our conversation. Absolutely. It should be great. Awesome. Well, as I mentioned, a lot of changes in the last few months. We're all, as you can see, recording this from our home offices at this point. Um, you know, in March of this year, I think we all changed drastically and started working from home due to COVID. Uh, and then we had kind of the one-two punch for the oil industry of the oil crisis and the Russia, Saudi Arabia uh, price war. And that's really impacted the companies that we deal with. And I know that Casey reports on. Um, and I think it's not surprising that the majority of the transformation that is happening in the oil and gas industry now is being driven by outside events. Um, they're facing a lot more competition from other forms of energy than they ever have. And it's surprising to me now that it's not just driving the traditional reaction in the industry, which was operational improvements, cost cutting. While we're seeing that, and we'll talk more about how that's happening, it's also driving significant changes in how the business model for these companies. And they're not all going the same direction, not all taking the same approach. and. I would, my opinion, I think it's taking a very different approach um, than we've seen in the past. And so for the first time, actually, Capgemini has included in our uh, World Energy Markets Observatory that just came out, the a chapter specifically dedicated to oil and gas. We've always focused in WeMo on energy and very much on electricity and what was happening there. This year, we have a whole chapter on oil and gas, and I think it goes to show how much the oil and gas and the electricity industry, you know, are really becoming more intertwined than ever before. So without further ado, I, let's jump into some conversation. I think it'll be good to have, we've got, I should have mentioned Patrice uh, based in Europe and Casey based in Phoenix, and I'm based in Houston. So. We've covered a little bit of geographic diversity <laughs> as well. Um, you know, renewable energy, I think, represents kind of the most attractive new business area uh, outside of typical oil and gas core. And the best way probably to help pure oil and gas players reduce their emissions levels while they continue to operate their core business. Uh, I'm really curious in what each of you are seeing across the market that's driving this. Casey, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, uh, to your point about these kind of underlying trends that are going on in the background, uh, something that has been starting uh, even before COVID, that COVID has accelerated, is really a structural shift in capital away from traditional oil and gas. That's kind of happened on a couple fronts that's kind of really important to understand about this idea of this kind of increasing competition. Uh, a lot of banks are starting to pull away from funding traditional upstream oil and gas outright. Others are becoming a lot more selective. Uh, still others are kind of putting their oil and gas teams under wider umbrellas that also look at infrastructure, at power, you know, renewables. And so oil and gas investments are having to compete for capital under that kind of wider umbrella. They're also being benchmarked on an ESG standpoint 
against these kind of other business lines. And if you kind of combine that with a pullback in kind of your general equity investor from the space uh, due to really a decade of pretty poor returns um, that have clearly um, come to a head in kind of the downturn this year and rising concerns for ESG, there's just kind of a broader need to rethink the business, rethink the investor proposition, rethink how the oil and gas sector uh, kind of keeps uh, its access to capital and certainly affordable capital. And I think that that's kind of a really important underlying shift that is, is kind of driving some of these these changes we're seeing. And Patrice, I, I know that, you know, being based in Europe, you've looked a lot and helped co-author the WeMo chapter on oil and gas at what is happening and some of the directions and stated goals that these companies are making. What are you seeing? Well, what we see is uh, first um, something which has never happened, uh, which is uh, uh, oil forecast, which is decreasing, oil production forecast decreasing, or oil production demand decreasing. And if you combine that with just what has been said previously uh, regarding the return on capital, return on investment, uh, we see that today the oil and gas companies are struggling uh, for their survival and, and their target uh, now uh, is to become more resilient. Uh, and then what we see uh, is that instead of focusing on their uh, core oil and gas activity only, uh, which is what they have done since the, the last decades, today they are opening up and they are widening uh, the area of uh, business, uh, and they are opening it towards, um, I would say, two major uh, areas. One is how to leverage on uh, their experience in the oil and gas to lower their core emissions. And second one is how to enter new business, and mainly new business means renewable or electricity uh, production. I mean, Casey, as a market observer and reporter, you know, what are you seeing in terms of players using um, carbon capture and other kind of additions or changes to their business as they operate, you know, versus just what I think um, we would have thought as, you know, moving into renewables as being purely wind and solar in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you're seeing is a, a huge um, kind of spectrum of, of strategies employed, right? I mean, the, the most kind of perhaps aggressive portfolio shifts we're seeing are on the European side, where if you have a, a net zero full emissions, both your operational emissions and your customers emissions kind of goals, you have to radically change your business. And so that's where you see the biggest talk around kind of building up these entire new divisions around renewables and such. But there's still, you know, for the companies that want to maybe remain oil and gas producers at, at large or at heart, um, they still have to address emissions too. And I think it's really important to understand that that is in itself an enormous challenge, right? I, I've seen figures around just kind of the operational emissions of the oil and gas sector are more than the um, cement and steel industries combined, right? That's, that's a huge ask. And so what we're seeing is um, absolutely uh, some talk around uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, the difficulty there is it is really not economic in most cases. Um, so you have to see a really high level of government participation. Like, for example, there's a, a recent project that uh, Equinor and um, Total um, and one other I can't think of uh, just uh, joined called Northern Lights. And the Norwegian government is funding 80 percent of the phase one of that project. Right. Or you see um, a company like Occidental Petroleum in the U.S. Permian Basin is a huge advocate for CCS. Um, they one, there are tax incentives in the U.S. that support that. And two, they have uh, enhanced oil recovery operations that give them a home for that carbon. So it, um, but there is a recognition and growing one across the industry that there needs to be some breakthroughs in this space because for oil and gas to really take a, a large chunk of its emissions off the table, that needs to be on on the table, essentially. But we're also seeing um, kind of emerging this idea of maybe a company doesn't want to become a renewable energy 
generator as a business, but they're looking at renewables to operate their own operations. So Chevron, for instance, has taken a really big step this year in this space. You know, they're going to have renewable power uh, in the US and in Kazakhstan and Argentina, so a pretty diverse footprint. We have seen companies like Occidental again look at renewables to to power their upstream. So that that is certainly an, an area too where we we see renewables supporting oil and gas as opposed to supplanting it. And then maybe kind of the final thing that we're starting to hear more on is is almost what, what companies are calling kind of like marginal ab abatement, where they have kind of accept that uh, you know on an ongoing basis there is maybe. 100 million dollars plus a year that they're going to need to spend to to invest incrementally on things that can clean up their operations and we're starting to see companies like conoco phillips and others do these kind of asset by asset reviews just basically taking stock of what they can do to mitigate that footprint I I, as you kind of touched on, and I think Patrice, you were starting to get into it. I want to ask you a little bit more kind of how are we seeing then different oil and gas companies transforming their business strategies? And Patrice, I'll start with you. Do you have a way of looking at those um, kind of differing and divergent um, business strategies? Yeah, then going back to what we said, um, we can see, depending on, on the type of the company and the location, that there are uh, naturally some uh, different trends. Uh, if you are a national oil company, of course, uh, you are part of uh, your national budget and national incomes. And then, uh, in a way, you, you will defend uh, your uh, your oil and gas industry because it's, it's part of uh, your quality of living. If you now uh, are in a, in a country where you have a, a lot of push uh, towards uh, cleaner uh, energy, then uh, you are going to be able to move a little out, or at least to communicate that you are moving out from the oil and gas. And this is uh, in, in vast majority the case for the European one. And then in between these two, you have the uh, Northern American, where um, the tendency is to, not to move away, but uh, then to, to reduce the emissions. Uh, and, and previously, it was said the targets uh, and we can see this difference into the target set. Uh, we are speaking more about uh, net zero for European, having very aggressive or ambitious uh, targets. Whereas the uh, American one are more on uh, reducing the emissions or at least focusing on their core activity and not what uh, what their customers are going to, uh, to emit. If we go uh, on, on this one, then uh, what is uh, what will be uh, and what we see as a common trend uh, is uh, carbon storage, uh, like, like was mentioned previously. And we are seeing today a lot of uh, new projects. Uh, so it was mentioned Northern Light with uh, Equinor and Total and Shell, but also other projects uh, in the North Sea, uh, led by BP. And what we see today uh, is that uh, these topics uh, going up and up on the agenda of uh, most of the uh, majors, because this will be um, a win-win uh, for them. Uh, first, they will uh, be able to uh, uh, decrease their own emissions uh, and, and to lower the overall emissions, uh, even from their client uh, perspective. And second point, it's also a way for them to leverage on their knowledge, on their know-how, on their experience, to be able to uh, meet the target in a way and to contribute. So it's uh, uh, both a way to uh, uh, secure their license to operate, but also to uh, leverage on, on their knowledge. And what is interesting uh, on this point is that uh, carbon capture and carbon storage is not a new topic, but since uh, I would say the 1980s, uh, it has been tested, but never on an economic way. And this is where uh, the government's incentive uh, and all this new regulation can, can have a boost in technology and in terms of uh, economicity of such project. So I think overall there are some differences, uh, especially on the uh, renewable aspect, but still there are some common trends that uh, all this have a lot of um, knowledgeable people, a lot of experience in uh, capital project, and, and they are going to leverage that to uh, secure and to meet 
the next uh, challenges in terms of uh, energy. Casey, anything to, to add from your perspective there? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with everything Patrice has just laid out. So maybe just a couple observations. I mean, one of the interesting things that we've seen take place this year is I think some of these issues have accelerated or come to a head or there's a real um, kind of um, inescapable uh, understanding that maybe we're getting a very condensed preview, you know, of, of, of some of the pressures ahead is we're almost kind of seeing a wave kind of maybe go across the globe. I mean, obviously we're seeing the biggest changes happen in European countries, and that makes sense from a number of kind of both cultural and market perspectives. Um, but there is a reality that this is a global market and that, you know, customers' needs are are changing and they're becoming more ESG minded or more carbon minded as well. You know, we've heard China say that it wants carbon neutrality by 2060. We've seen instances of kind of these carbon neutral LNG cargos where there's some kind of offset program um, gain a little bit of appetite in Asia. And that means to stay competitive, this kind of has to be on everyone's radar. And so while yes, you, you have uh, maybe your kind of most core uh, oil national oil companies, you know, your Saudi Aramco's that understand that they have the lowest cost oil and they are going to be the last producer standing, uh, maybe have to do a little bit less strategically to stay. But, you know, I, I've, I think what's really caught my eye this year is to hear a company like Qatar Petroleum, okay, a massive LNG producer, uh, put forward uh, the largest CCS project in the MENA region with plans to more than double that by 2025, or to hear, you know, a number of the Asian NOCs start to put renewables in their MA programs alongside oil and gas. You know, Petronas has kind of put forward this, what they call the third way, where to meet their state mandate, they need to still grow oil and gas, but they also need to start growing in renewables and gain that competency as well. And so I just think that we're really gonna start seeing a huge spectrum, but also a blending where kind of the lines are, are not so maybe clear cut. I think in the US, what is interesting is we are starting to, to see some movement there as opposed to maybe the US just being this block, maybe as it's thought, you know, I think with company like Exxon, uh, they are very much of the view that oil and gas demand is going to main ro be ro remain robust and likely maybe even blow through kind of Paris targets. And if a technology kind of comes forward, that's great. But for them, they, they think kind of a stay the course works. Chevron is really attempting to put in kind of a more incremental approach, you know, and as long as investors kind of allow them to work at that pace, then 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 that works where essentially they've really stepped up in renewable natural gas this year and made some kind of a market commercial investments. The idea is they, they want to link things to oil and gas, not supplant their traditional oil and gas business. And we've seen companies that are independents that are going to remain in oil and gas start to acknowledge they have to to put forward kind of emissions targets of themselves. So ConocoPhillips, you know, uh, one of the largest independent producers in the world, uh, just put forward net zero ambitions for its operational missions by 2050 and has made very clear that uh, while their ambitions, because it will require some technology, you know, breakthroughs to get there, they're not sitting on their hands and they very much see it as, as something they need to get to. And maybe just kind of one final point on how this is influencing strategic thinking. We've seen M&A uh, at, at a corporate level kind of pick up uh, in the US. And I think to your point, Tracy, you mentioned earlier about some of the kind of a traditional responses to a downturn, you know, cost cutting synergies that, that that's absolutely at play and every company is working to lower its break even. But one of the things we've also heard is this idea of a shift in what the industry believes effective scale is. And the bar has kind of been raised. I think there's to really kind of survive, uh, the companies really see themselves needing to be large. And part of that is at some point, I think everyone understands they will have to manage emissions in some capacity. And it's very hard to do that in a very fragmented space it's much easier to take care of your emissions if you're doing it over a larger profile. So it's kind of in the background, I think, of, of what we're seeing. Thanks for that. Um, 
you know, as we kicked off this chat, you know, we had to acknowledge, you know, this is a an interesting year, 2020 COVID-19 oil price crisis, um, kind of dealt the industry a double whammy at the end of Q1. And here we are in, you know, solidly in Q4. Um, I'm curious, have you seen these events cause the renewable initiatives at these oil and gas companies to to accelerate, to halt? Um, is it status quo? Patrice, what are you seeing? Well, what we see um, in, in a way is uh, an, an accept maybe as a collateral uh, effect um, due to this so much, so, such a low oil price basically uh, all the companies uh, have to uh, uh, enter the survival mode and they uh, like as i said on the, previously they were thinking about the next wave and today uh, due to the low and lower price and and it's likely not to change um, they they have to find another way uh, without going outside but still they have to find another way and they have to find it quite uh, rapidly uh, because because of this survival mode, but also because of the uh, acceptability uh, towards the opinion. Um, and if we take the uh, example of, uh, of Total, uh, Total is now uh, uh, changing completely its organization by creating uh, an entity, a new entity, which will be uh, dedicated to the engineering uh, and construction. And this entity will cover all the activities of the group. So, which means not only ENP, but ENP, uh, raf raffinery, but also everything uh, related to renewables. And this is what uh, what is going to happen in the in the next uh, years or months or years is instead of uh, just doing business as usual, basically they are accelerating the shift and they are creating the organization, creating the, the workforce to be able to answer the problem globally, and not only. Uh, with the oil and gas point of view. And I think uh, this is where COVID uh, the shift. It did not accelerate the shift outside oil and gas. It accelerated the shift towards the end-to-end -end value chain where oil and gas players are not only uh, focusing on uh, output from traditional activities, but they are enla enlarging the scope and they are taking advantage of both this situation and the fact that now people want to give a sense to what they are doing, they want to contribute, they take advantage of this to build new organizations and to better address the problem on an end-to-end -end perspective. I, I kind of agree. I've seen, you know, obviously we saw the traditional kind of OPEX and CAPEX cuts that came very quickly in kind of late Q1, early Q2. Um, but then we've seen, uh, you know, projects that have continued to move forward and, you know, Total is not the only, um, you know, oil company that we've seen that's gone through a massive shift. I mean, BP's, you know, announcement and total reorg of they're going to be an international energy company, not an international oil company, you know, Chevron's reorging the new you know, news that Shell's going to be reorging, um, you know, Exxon announcing in, we'll be making some cuts. Um, I don't think we've heard a, a reorg announcement from them, but we're seeing this happening across a number of these organizations during this time period. Um, Casey, from how the investors are reacting, what you're seeing is that shift in the organizational structure being acknowledged and rewarded? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the key from the investor perspective is there's the there's been kind of this evolution in terms of they want the ambition, right? They want the, the long term target articulated and they want to know what that means in the near term, too. And so what companies are really having to do and to, to tangibly de demonstrate is how you get from A to B when B is so far away. And so the, the Total, Shell, BP, others are, are having to really put forward a very detailed blueprint, say for the next decade, 
what exactly is it that you are doing to your business? How are you going to continue to bring in cash while you're making these transformational changes? And what do you expect for the investor on a return standpoint moving forward? And we have seen some kind of bifurcation a bit in how that is perceived. I mean, uh, you know, I would say that uh, BP, as you said, you know, kind of put forward this very impressive kind of week long presentation on how they're changing um but they they are a little bit more financially strapped than than shell and total they are further behind the um kind of the curve in making that transformation and so to kind of get there uh, they are having to make much more significant changes to their portfolio right they're projecting a 40 percent decline in their oil and gas production in the next decade um, and it means that that they are far more exposed to their execution in these new businesses. Investors are a little a little concerned about that. And again, just until, at least until they can kind of see how things play out. Whereas kind of maybe a, a Shell and Total are being a little bit better received uh, just because they have a little bit more to demonstrate to date to show what they can do. But also there's just not kind of quite that aggressive pivot, right? Oil maybe will be flat, uh, gas will grow, and then these other businesses will grow. It's a little bit maybe easier to kind of see see how, where things go. Right. Well, I I want to I'm going to bring in a something very 2020. So there's a meme floating around online that has uh, who who led your company's digital transformation. And the options are CEO, the CTO slash CIO, or COVID nineteen. Um, and then, you know, COVID-19 kind of as the, the funny answer in that, um, but kind of on a more serious note, what role do you think digital transformation is going to play in the move to renewables? Um, um, you know, when, when we have uh, the shareholders on, on one side and you have, uh, I would say, uh, not on the other side, but uh, the employees, the collaborators and the, uh, uh, the customers on the other side, Basically, today, um, the oil and gas uh, industry was seen as very traditional, very uh, capex intensive, um, and 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 it doesn't match with uh, the younger generation, uh, which is likely to work uh, on a tablet, on a smartphone, on what, whatever they materialized, and and who also wants to have uh, a sense toward what they are what they are doing uh, on their personal, but also on their professional life. And having said that, uh, the transformation we see towards uh, the uh, renewable is in a way the same one than towards the digital. Um, all the companies were in a way hesitating uh, towards the digital transformation from the last decade. Uh, and then I would say the same wave is arriving and it's pushing the digital transformation on top of all these priorities. Priorities for uh, I would say, um, attractiveness of uh, the company. Uh, if you are not digital in a way, you are less attractive towards the youngest. And also attractive because digital is uh, will, will be a kind of transverse way to improve uh, your, uh, your um, resilience, to improve your performance. And anything which is developed, uh, I would say, for traditional oil and gas domain can be beneficial for the rest. Uh, and then this is... I, I see today uh, for the companies, digital or digital transformation as a way also to build some new organization. And you can see that on some of the Europeans, like ENI, for example, where uh, digital and IT are transverse and they are no longer dedicated to one of the perimeter, but they are there to serve the entire company. And I think this is something that we are going to see along uh, the uh, entire value chain development where you are no longer just ENP or oil and gas, but more an energetician, you will also have this data and digital transformation that will support all your business, no matter where you, you lay in the uh, value chain. And Casey, what are you seeing um, in terms of this? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with exactly how Patrice put it. I mean, we're seeing these work reorganizations and kind of the digital transformation is kind of almost like a, a web that's linking it together. I mean, because what you're basically having producers have to do is, this is granted an oversimplification, but go from a model where they could produce 
their you know materials and put it in a market and know that it was going to be used right the demand was going to be there um, and that just isn't the case anymore and so so much of what we're hearing is a need to become customer focused customer driven there if you're an energy provider that means being able to provide many different forms of energy in many different ways and so just the kind of coordination that that's going to take to execute that well, to kind of drive that margin addition that these companies kind of see as giving them a competitive advantage over say a standalone utility. It's really going to require a very fundamental rethink around these businesses from an organizational standpoint, but just an operational standpoint as well. And this digitalization is just gonna play a huge role in that. I mean, both of you kind of mentioned um... Casey, you mentioned customers and appealing to customers. Patrice, you mentioned, you know, appealing to kind of the younger demographic. I I think that uh, applies to both their employee base, which we've, you know, it's no surprise that, you know, traditional oil and gas companies have had an, an older um, employee base. And I think that there's really a shift happening now. And they, they also are having to, they're less attractive potentially to, um, you know, young new hires as a career path. So they need to be, to do things to be more interesting to and appealing to some of those, the new generation in terms of their employee base. Um, you know, I, I think that I've seen a shift in how it brings a new excitement to the industry, I would almost say, in terms of the customer focus, because no longer is it very clear what's the product that they're selling. There's this opportunity for what other products are they going to be selling? Um, what markets will they play into? And you know that goes for especially the oil and gas companies that are moving to be you know, have more of kind of an electricity generation aspect, whether that's going to be directly, you know, end use customer facing, um, you know, are we going to see a, a shift in who the customers are instead of being the end customer, potentially, you know, somebody who's putting gasoline in their car, are we going to see a shift in who that, that end customer is and, how does that impact either the the employees or who how the companies are, are operating? I think um, um, we are we are entering uh, an, an area of uh, uh, end user experience uh, and and basically today um, either as a customer or as, or as an employee uh, there must be a sense in what you are doing or in what you are buying. Um, and, and this uh, this sense can be seen uh, now in the uh, I would say everything what uh, Kaze was saying previously uh, in, in the shift of uh, the company towards an end to end. Uh, you need to have a I would say a seamless experience when you buy or you produce your energy, no matter where it comes from or where it ends. Basically, the important is that there is a, a seamless uh, understanding and a seamless experience. And and I'm. I'm, uh, I'm convinced that uh, the shift that is ongoing, which is a seamless experience, will continue, and that um, basically we will move from uh, siloed uh, industries toward really uh, uh, an energy provider. No matter if you are filling your tank or if you are using your microwave, you will have an energy provider that can uh, fulfill uh, all your needs in a sense that. Uh, is uh, in line uh, with your own personal opinion. And it's not just happening at the individual level either, right? I mean, we're seeing, you know, BP, Shell, others, they're talking about uh, commercial partnerships, you know, partnering with Microsoft or Amazon, and like they're going to meet their energy needs across a variety of spaces, municipalities and things of that sort. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of seamless interface will happen you know, at a very small level, you know, to a, a very large level as well. And, and that's part of where we're seeing that shift happen. So as we start to kind of wrap up this discussion, I know we we could talk for, for hours on this topic and get into much more detail, but I'm sure that those watching aren't going to 
to want to play along with us for for hours and hours. Um, I'm curious, Patrice, what are oil and gas players likely to do now that's going to prepare them for the future of renewables? Kind of what's your forward looking thought? I think now um, what they what they, they, they tend to do and what it will accelerate is how to leverage on their existing workforce uh, to convert and to enter these new topics. If they just uh, if they just consider uh, that they can enter new areas where you have uh, pure players without any uh, strengths, then they will die because they won't they won't be competitive. So they really have to leverage on their existing knowledge, their existing capabilities, uh, and in a way uh, to to revert this capability towards new project, uh, new uh, investment. If they succeed in doing so, then. Uh, I think they can play a very good role uh, and they will have all their place. Casey, what do you see kind of as next steps? You know, what level of excitement do you have about um, renewables when it comes to the oil and gas industry? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the biggest thing for me is to see how it starts to almost kind of creep its way into the industry beyond that the simple diversification, not that that diversification is simple, but but that there's this idea of how how do they kind of interlake or work together? Um, you know, like I said, you know there are going to be a multitude of producers that you know can't afford or aren't positioned to be able to necessarily become the diversified energy provider for you know municipalities across the globe. That's just not the capability they have. But how do they look to these both renewables and low carbon technologies at large to to start to try to make their core businesses keep keep a place in the energy mix, kind of keep that social license to operate, I think is something I really am interested to see play out because I think you know, regardless of policies, there is an underlying Kind of shift going on just at a societal level where there are expectations on these on these companies to to demonstrate good stewardship and so i think this move toward emissions ambitions and targets and kind of tangibly showing the roadmap over the next five ten years is something that we're going to see certainly in the u.s in the next you know 18 months two years but it, it really is going to become global in its own way well, I really appreciate uh, the time and enjoy chatting with you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today's discussion. Um, you know, special thanks to our panelists, Casey Merriman from Energy Intelligence, Patrice Jelno from Capgemini uh, and Bent. And to keep up with the latest in Capgemini thought leadership, visit our website and engage with us on the Capgemini Energy and Utilities LinkedIn page.